This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA, it's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. SMC Podcast Network. My name is Chris Blades. And before I get started today, I want to make sure I take the time to remind you guys, as always, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast. Please make sure you never miss an episode. Make sure you're always on top when we drop our latest stuff. Also, if you could, please as well, if you like what you hear today, if you like what you've heard in the past, um, if you could, please give us a five-star rating, write a nice review. We really appreciate it. Very helpful. It allows you to guys like, what you guys dislike, the ways you can improve, all that fun stuff. And also, if you're on social media, we're on social media, so you can find us there, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, we can talk, we can chat, we can debate, we can discuss, and now that the MLB season is at least going to happen, which was something that was definitely up in the air um, before the last few days or so, it's now time to talk storylines, because I mean, it's something that we never really got to get into, or we never really got into, or at least I personally never got into, just because... By the time, like, there was some spring training stuff, and I was going to do some stuff closer to when the season started. Then the Rona hit. Everything got shut down. And then, obviously, we've been without major team sports, at least ever since. We've had, like, little, like, we have had golf and NASCAR and some tennis or some, like, um, do some, uh, like, European soccer, Spanish soccer, German soccer. I think Liverpool won the Premier League for the first time in 30 years today. I don't know too much about the Premier League, but... I know it was a big deal, at least checking my Twitter. So, shout out to Liverpool. Um, shout out to LeBron. I think he's like some sort of minority owner or something there. So, look, brothers, LeBron signs on, all of a sudden the team win championships. I mean, it doesn't, it sounds basically like him going, leaving, leaving to go to the Heat or leaving to come back to the Cavs. All of a sudden, teams acquire LeBron, even as an owner. And all of a sudden, look at that. They're going to championships. They're winning championships. But that's not the point. The point is, we are going to discuss some baseball. And I know ESPN put out, um, I, uh, who was the right? I think it was David Schoenfield. Hopefully I pronounced that right. Um, he's a writer for ESPN. And he put out the, his top 60 storylines heading into the season. And I'm not going to go through all of them. I mean, if you want to. And just to get yourself kind of in the mood, back in the, back in the baseball mindset, back in the sports mindset overall. If you want to go through and read that, it's pretty... It's pretty good, and obviously it's 60 storylines, so he's, he touches on just about everything you could you would think of, at least. But with that being said, um, there was some that I want to touch on. And the first and obviously biggest storyline, in my opinion, heading into the season, is Mookie Betts is now a Dodger. If you don't remember, um, which, I mean, you probably do, but just again, just refresh everybody's mind, because it, it feels like it was last year that this happened. But again, this year's just been so long at this point. In February, Mookie Betts and David Price were traded to the Dodgers for Alex Verdugo, Jeter Downs, and Connor Wong in sort of like a move that kind of, you could say, sparked a rebuild of sorts in Boston. And I guess, I know they had some they had some issues getting the trade done, too. That was like kind of the weird thing. It was it was like, I think they tried it, then like they had to like cancel the one deal. And I think Jock Peterson was supposed to get traded at some point, but then he didn't. Or maybe he still did get traded. Ah, that's what I'm saying. It, it's been so long. Um... I know they, were, they had some trades in place and it didn't work out. But long story short, Mookie Betts in a Dodgers uniform. So uh, that is a big deal for the Dodgers as a team who's been like right there. Though, I mean, they did run to the Astros and might have gotten cheated. Well, not might have. They got cheated out of a World Series. I'm going to say, but then they, uh, well, then they ran to the Red Sox and the same thing happened. So that's rough. <laughs> um, but still... 
Mookie Betts on the team now. So hopefully that can get them over the hump to finally win that elusive World Series that they haven't won. And I know it's been at least, I think probably like the 80s. I want to say it's been a while since the Dodgers have won a World Series. And I mean, Mookie Betts over the past four seasons has arguably been the second best player in the majors behind Mike Trout in terms of, he's behind only Mike Trout in terms of war. Though, I mean, you could even argue he's the second best player on his own team with Cody Bellinger, the league's reigning MVP. But the Betts makes the Dodgers obviously better on defense. He's a very good defensive player. And they now have arguably the best lineup in the game. Even after they finished second to the Astros last year in batting average, um, on allowed balls and playing first in the majors in defensive runs save. So, long story short, 60 games, 162 games, it doesn't matter. Dodgers were, always always have been, and always will be, at least until something catastrophic happens in terms of like injuries or something. Um, World Series favorites. That's where, I mean, I think they're like, have the, I think their win total set at like 37 or something, which is the highest. And so, their favorites, people expect them to be there. Hopefully, this can be the year they get um, they get over that hump because if not, Dave Roberts might be out of there. Honestly, we'll see what happens. Honestly, how it goes down and everything. But I mean, at this point, I mean, I don't know how many chances you get to lead or be the manager of a team that's as talented as the Dodgers have been over the last three or four years, or potentially even longer, and have nothing to show for. Again, they made it to the World Series, which isn't nothing. But it don't mean a thing if you ain't got that ring. Shout out to the 72 and 10 Bulls. Um, so, yeah, like they're getting to the World Series. They're going far, which is cool. But then they're um, they're losing. Or like last year, they lose in the divisional series to the eventual World Series champions, the Nationals. Um, and Roberts kind of had a hand in that. He probably shouldn't have left Kershaw in to face Rendon and Soto. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a, the best move, at least. Um, but yeah, you know, you live in your, I mean, you would think you live in your learn cause you and Kershaw's had his ups and downs in the playoffs, but David Roberts or Dave Roberts hasn't learned yet. And he's going to need to learn soon because if you can't win with this team, I don't like what team can you win with, honestly. And again, there's other things that are going to play. It's obviously a weird season, so I don't want to blame it all on him per se, but I mean, at some point, someone's got to take the fall for this. And generally speaking, it's not normally the players. So hopefully for Dave Roberts, job security, the Dodgers can live up to their favorite status. And speaking of favorites, if you flip over to the AL, that'll probably be the Yankees. So with them, they also made a big acquisition this year. They, or I guess in the offseason, acquired Garrett Cole um, to an, um, on a nine-year, two hundred no, not 200, excuse me, $324 million deal. He entered his new se- or entered the season coming off of the end of last season where he was 16-0 and with the 1.78 ERA over his final 22 starts with the Astros. And that stretch featured 16 games of double-digit strikeouts, including his final nine in a row. He did lose a game in the postseason, but went 4-1 one, but went four and one with a 1.72 ERA in five starts. And even in the one game where I think it was, no, it was in the, against the Nationals. Or no, I'm trying to remember no, I think it was the Nationals in the World Series. He still didn't even have his good stuff. I remember he faced the Yankees in the playoffs, too, so they didn't have his good stuff. No, I think, okay, I'm thinking of the game against the Yankees. Um, where he didn't even have his good stuff and was still in the playoffs and was still able to find a way to win. That's what good pitchers do, and that's what Garrett Cole is. He's a good pitcher, and that's what you could say the Yankees have been missing. They've been missing that dominant ace in the rotation. Like, they've had the pitching. I mean, they've had the hitting when it's when they're not striking out. They've had... The defense has been pretty solid. They've had the bullpen, but just like the starting pitching is kind of what held the team back, which is why they went out and signed Garrett Cole. So we'll have to see if um, if that matters um, for them this year. Again, it's a weird season, so um, he's only going to get but so many starts. So that's kind of unfortunate for the Yankees this year because you would want Garrett Cole out there as many games as you could have him. But again, he's probably won 60 games if you... On that, like he's probably going to get like eleven starts somewhere around there, eleven, twelve, depending on how many. If they do like the typical like, um, they the days rest in between, but who knows how that'll go. But yeah, regardless, Dodgers, Yankees, those are the two favorites in each of the uh, in each of their respective leagues. Um, maybe you get their first 
or maybe you get the first Dodgers World Series, Dodgers Yankees World Series since 1981, um, which would obviously be big for the sport, big for rankings, um, ratings, excuse me, big for eyeballs, just because, I mean, you got two of the most prominent franchises, um, two opposite ends of the coast, like, two opposite ends of the country, I guess you could say. So, I mean, that's, I mean, I don't know what other matchup could draw in the amount of eyeballs that a Yankees-Dodgers World Series could potentially bring in. So, we'll see about that. Another big storyline for this year, um, potentially maybe, you know, Mike Trout gets to the World Series. I mean, that's not to the World Series rule. Time out. That's not going to happen. Uh, well, you never, you never say never, but let's just get to the playoffs first before we start worrying about the World Series here. Mike Trout, but he finally has got a little help. Um, they went out and signed the second biggest free agent of the offseason, which is Anthony Rendon, to a seven-year deal. Um, Trout is coming off his third MVP win in 2019 and now has someone to kind of help him out in the lineup. The Angels' number three hitter batted 265. Um, with a will slash on 265, 323, and 464 in 2019, ranking 21st in the majors. While the Nationals' number three hitter, which was mainly Rendon, ranked um, first. I guess it was him and Soto, depending on the day. So, I mean, that's a big boost to the lineup. Also, I guess, uh, so yeah, we got to see how that goes. Hopefully, um, hopefully that can bring, give them a little boost. And then, like I said, just, I mean, just Mike Trout in general. He's now entering his age 28 season. And it'll turn 29 in August. So he's theoretically entering the decline phase of his career, quote unquote. But, I mean, he's been up until this point one of the greatest baseball players of all time. So, see kind of what the season holds for him and all what the season holds for the Angels. Because obviously, the theory behind getting someone like Rendon was hey, we're, we want to try to do what we can to help try it out. To, like I said, at least get him some postseason appearances and like I'll see what happens from there happens from there but I mean he's barely even been to the playoffs if he's I mean if if he's been it's been like very few times so I'm saying that's what he's missing from his resume he's got three MVPs but like little to no postseason stats so that's kind of what you need to I mean that's where legends are made is in October and then November so we want to try to do that also I mean the biggest winner of this whole pandemic, which I mean, I don't want to say there's any winners because people are dying, but from the baseball perspective, this definitely helped took, uh, definitely helped take some of the um, anger away from the Astros because I was even, even with them even being that I was going to have a season, but like, I'm mean, not saying people forgot about the Astros, but I mean, now instead of getting booed and getting ridiculed for 81 road games and potentially even more games, even, even when they're at home. This was again visiting fans and stuff. Only got sixty games they gotta deal with. And and people don't have time in theory, like the like the team stuff wasting like games like fighting them and doing things. So you get suspended, now you miss in instead of missing like all right, you get a little ten game suspension, five game suspension, whatever. Five games now is is a is a good chunk of the season. Ten games is like I said, it's the sixth of the year it's sixth of the season. So that's a that's a huge loss. So just interesting to see how what what kind of response the Astros will get because I mean and also there's no fans so we'll even forget about that um, so forget about the reaction necessarily on the field from the fans there's not going to be any so like all right people can tweet mean things and like um, say mean things I guess when they I don't know you're not even going to be around the stadium so like they really lucked out in that regard like all right players are still going to be mad which is cool but like they won't have to deal with the fans anger until next year and who knows who could come out with more um sign stealing stuff by then so the Astros really lucked out so just seeing how they deal with that and also dealing again with the loss of Garrett Cole seeing how if they can if they how they adjust to being the villain because instead of being like the oh like this is a cool story like this is what happens when you not to say tank but when you like rebuild property this is what you can become have a bunch of homegrown guys adding a free agent here or there get some pitchers here and there make some good acquisitions, boom, you could be in a World Series, win a World Series, and, like, be one of the best teams in baseball over a three- and four-year period. But now, they go from, like, again, the team everyone was, not everyone was rooting for, but just, like, the team people were happy to see do well. Now they're going to be, like I said, the enemy in the sport. So seeing how they handle that and if they can adjust that kind of life, because not everyone's built to be the villain. 
And that's kind of the thing. So um, I guess the one other thing I'll touch on, because obviously we talked about it in the last episode, was the was the DH, universal DH. Um, obviously, it's a thing that I don't have an issue with. Again, I'm not necessarily a baseball purist, because I also um, believe the steroid era was, was the best era of baseball, at least in my lifetime. I'm not that old, so I don't, I don't, I don't know, I haven't looked through a lot of baseball, but in my lifetime, the steroid era was the best era because people like home runs, which is why I kind of people, some people kind of liked last year as well. But with the universal DH, um, it was just time. Pitchers last year batted 128, struck out 43.5% of their plate appearances. Um, then again, um, from this article, they did hit 115 in 2018, so maybe they were getting a little bit better, but still. I mean, and generally speaking, I understand that it's cool to have pitchers that can hit. I mean, obviously, Bartolo Colon's home run was one of the cooler moments in the last few years from a pitcher hitting standpoint. But, I mean, generally speaking, these guys are just automatic outs. So, adding in a DH in, in, to the NL, I think, will just benefit. And then, again, it's just it provides more strategy, um, more different ways to set up your lineup, different people to um, to pick into your lineup because again, if you're if your pitcher is pitching, you can't really be like, oh, it doesn't really matter who's pitching on the other side because like you just have to accept that they're going to hit. Now you could potentially add in another good batter to your lineup, or in theory, you'd add in another good batter. And then like again, there's there are people in the end. I know I talked about this with the Mets specifically, but just like they have guys like a like a Don Smith or a Cespedes who maybe will be better served as a DH than they would be having to fit them into the field somewhere. Um, especially Cespedes because he's coming off all the injuries. This is the perfect kind of um, move for them. The perfect kind of uh, change for them just because now they, they have guys that are suited for DH roles that just happen to play in the NL. And now here we go. We'll see how it goes. Again, I don't think it'll be that big of a change. I don't really see the downside of it per se because, I mean, it's already... I always thought it was weird that they had different rules for different leagues because I'm like, what other sport does that? But... Is what it is. Don't gotta worry about it anymore. But yeah, like I said, there's like there's obviously a lot more than the four or five I touched on in this article. I mean, they go on talk about Juan Soto, the the White Sox may potentially being a dark horse team this year. How Bryce Harper is going to do in his second season? The the Judge and Stanton pairing, how that'll go? Almost going to happen with uh, I forgot I forgot the Angels signed Joe Madden too. So, that's another acquisition for Mike Trout trying to get him some more help. Um, Otani's back as well. DeGrom going for a third, Cy Young. So, like I said, a lot of storylines to look forward to into this baseball season, even though, again, it's going to be short. But I think that'll also be a benefit just because it allows people to, um, you know, the casual person doesn't have to be, um, like, in and out of the season. Like, all right, it's only 60 games. I could, you could, you could focus for 60 games. You focus for a lot of a lot of people focus for an 82 game NBA season, so 60 games of baseball is like nothing, especially compared to what it normally is. So we'll see. Regardless, it'll be an interesting year. And speaking of interesting, uh, this NASCAR Bubba Wallace story continues to take interesting twists and turns. So we will discuss the, the the findings of the NASCAR investigation, kind of the ramifications of that and also kind of why it's good that they had the response they did when they had it and when the issue was raised with them. So we'll discuss all that right after a break. Stay right there. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info.
MC Podcast Network. So, today, as a part of NASCAR kind of closing out their own personal investigation into what happened with um, with uh, the the whole noose situation, um, they released a photo of what was said to be hanging in um, Bubba Wallace's garage bay, or I think is what it's called. Basically, just where like they store the car or whatever. And if you look at the photo, you can see that what oh well, again not what he saw because he didn't see it. What I guess one of his crew members saw, then I guess, and then from there, what they reported to the higher ups in NASCAR looks exactly like a noose. Now you can say that oh, it's just a, a garage pull down, or you can say like oh, it's just a rope tying a knot to make it easier to like use to pull it down or whatever. But in NASCAR's own admission, they said that they they ha- they checked out all. The other 29 tracks where they race, where, where they raced, checked out all 684, or 16, 1684 garage stalls, and they found only 11 total ropes that had a pull down rope tied in a knot, and the only one that looked anything close to a noose, because whether, whatever you want to call it, like brothers know, like, you, 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 everyone knows what a noose looks like. Again, like, you, you, you see and you're just like, oh, okay, that's what that is. Like, you're like, all right. Now, if that might not be what it's being used for. It might not be, be used to harm anyone. But you know what it looks like. And, like, the only one that they found that looked anything like that was the one that just so happened to be in Bubba Wallace's garage bay. So, there is that. Um, they also claimed that, which is, I think, a little bit important, that the it did the rope did not look like that in October of 2019 at least the start of that weekend so at some point someone tied it like that now when i don't know who they haven't disclosed but it clearly was done deliberately by someone now again you could argue that oh it's just a tie to make it easier to pull down blah 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 but as they mentioned the like other people tied knots in order to again be able to pull it down easier, but none of them looked the way this one looked. So whether it was delivery for him or or whatever is a separate point, but it was deliberately tied in that fashion. So that in and of itself is a problem. And also, I guess they wanted to dispel. And, and I guess you can kind of now once you see that they see that. Um, See that photo you can easily spell it like it wasn't like a hoax. They didn't make it up. Um, just again, because it was there a while ago does not mean that that makes it okay. That's actually a bigger part of the issue. But I'll get to that in a second. Um, but yeah, so like as the president, I think it's NASCAR's president. Yeah, NASCAR's president, Steve Phelps said, uh, anyone who would suggest this was a hoax, I find it personally offensive. I don't know how people could think that way, though, in fairness. Um, I mean if you, <laughs> there was the video I saw of people down in Florida kind of like berating like the, like I guess council members or like doctors or whoever telling them about how evil and wrong it is to be wearing a mask even though it's been shown and has been proven in other countries that have done things like this that, that helps off the spread of coronavirus. But my point is that a lot of people just think a lot of different things. Like it's very hard and it'll probably never happen at least in, now in this country where you will get everyone to agree on something it's just not gonna happen people are going to find ways to believe whatever they want to believe and like i said whether whatever side you're on whatever belief you have is is your own choice but again there's always going to be someone that has the opposite side no matter again no matter what it is uh outside of maybe like the sky being blue and grass being green like anything else you can probably get someone to argue about it, whether right or wrong, whatever. You'll get someone to argue. So I am saying he's shocked, but there's no reason for him to be shocked. People literally just disagree or, or make up things about everything. So this is not news to me. But to go off that point about the whole hoax, again, anyone that wants to believe it's it was a hoax is going to believe it was a hoax. It is what it is. But with that picture now being out and publicized, it goes to show that, like, the concern 
was warranted, in my opinion. Again, you can feel free to disagree with me. Um, if you do, no, no big deal. But, in my opinion, the concern was warranted. If you don't, like I said, if that's, if that's not a common thing, which clearly it isn't, um, cause as they said in their investigation, no other garage pull down rope was fashioned like that. Um, if that's not a common thing, it's, it was only right to raise the concern. Like I said, whether it was his crew member or someone, just a random person in NASCAR saw it or like a driver from a different team saw it or Bubba Wallace himself saw it. Like it would be right to raise that concern. Like that's something that's like, whoa, okay, that's not supposed to be there. Um, we need to look into that. So that in and of itself is not like, it's not like just because it was there already does not make it not a, that doesn't make it a hoax. Like it was a legitimate thing that happened. There's photo, there's photographic proof of it. It, it looks literally like a news. So like that, like the whole hoax thing is like, is out of the question in my opinion. Um, but also going off that, if they didn't react the way that they did and that picture came out, then I think that would have looked worse for NASCAR. Cause as we kind of talked about in the last episode, NASCAR has chosen their side of the fight in this. And whether you agree with them, disagree with them is whatever, but they've chosen the side they're going to fight on and they're going to stand with Bubba and for the the rights and the humanity of black lives in this country and the things that they deal with on a daily basis and the things that they will continue to deal with probably for the forever. I mean, I don't want to say forever because uh, who knows, but at least for the, the time being, I should say. Let's put it that way, the time being. So they, they've, they've decided they're going to stay in support of that and then that's just going to be their message. So if that's going to be your message, if something like this comes up, you have to take a strong stance on it. You have to immediately condemn it. You have to let him know, just like let like let like let it be known, like hey, this is what this is what was found, and this is what we're doing about it. As you try to sweep this under the rug, then it looks bad on your part because you make it seem as if like oh you have something to hide. Like again, is this great? No, was it? intentionally um, designed for Bubba Wallace. Not necessarily. But if you just happen to, again, these apparently, from my understanding and my learning more about NASCAR in the recent weeks, these get randomly assigned. I guess they're designed by like, um, they're assigned, like the, the garage bays are assigned by like your standings. Um, your, I guess your standing on the leaderboards or, or like, again, like a, like, as you know, like, NASCAR has, like, after every race, you get points and stuff like that. So, you're you're, you're standing in that. So, supposedly, at least what I was told, I, I don't know, I could be wrong about that. But if that's true, then again, you couldn't know, per se, that he was going to get that one before you got there. But, like I said, once you, once you got there and that was noticed, NASCAR has to investigate it and has to, again, stand behind him and condemn it because... It looks worse if you try to hide it and then it comes out like, oh, this is what it was. Because you're trying to show that you are an inclusive sport. You want to be an inclusive sport. And obviously, you realize that what Bubba Wallace is standing for is is what you as a company want to stand for. So, and that's the case, you have to support him in, in what he goes through when it comes to, like, race issues or things like that. So, and, and I mean, also, I mean, it would have been weird if it was in anybody's stall, but again, he's the one black driver in in NASCAR's top circuit. He's he's um, condemned the Confederate flag recently. He's had a Black Lives Matter car, all that stuff. So, again, just the timing of it is kind of peculiar. So, again, you have to make sure that there's no foul play here, and it doesn't sound like there was, which in and of itself is good, but like I said, they needed to come out and make a strong statement against this because if they didn't then then once this, I mean either they would have to hide this photo and make sure it never came out but if, eventually it would have probably got leaked somehow and if that that was to be the case then then that's a whole different can of work you're getting ready to open up about like oh how did that happen and just the last kind of thing on this is the fact that like this kind of shows how much NASCAR still has to go in terms of their fight and their education on these issues just because, like, if that was hanging up there from October again, I don't know how often people are just in Talladega and stuff like that. 
But if everyone, if a bunch of people saw it and no one was like, this is weird, let's not tie it like that, then that's a bit of an issue, in my opinion. Because, like, if you just were, if you were anywhere and just saw that hanging up, you would just say, well, maybe again, I don't want to speak for everyone. Me as a black person, if I saw that anywhere, I'd be like, whoa, what is, what is this? Even if it's not, again, it's not designed to be used on me, it's not designed for me, it wasn't placed there to kind of send a message to me or anything, but if it's just anywhere, you'd be like, that's weird. So if people walked by it, didn't say anything, didn't untie it, no one thought it was strange or whatever, they're just like, hey, look, this is just the, the knot they decided to tie. That's, again, a part of the issue, which is why the whole, like, it's been there since October thing is better to a degree, but it's not, that's not like a great excuse. Like, why, why, why was it there since October? Why didn't, why was it there in the first place? Who tied it? Why did they tie it? What was the purpose of it? Again, you could argue for the uh, garage pull down thing, but again, no, no other garage pull down ropes are tied like that in there and all of their racetracks. Apparently they investigated all 29 of their racetracks, all, I guess what, almost 1700 of their garage bays. No other pull down rope looked like that. So that one was tied like that for a specific reason. For what reason, we won't know, unless the person that did it came forth, and they're not going to do that now. Um, unless, I guess, like a video comes out or something, which it would have already came out, I would, you would think, if they had one. But, um, so yeah, like that, the, the fact that it was there already doesn't make it that much better. It just means that like people saw it and were just like, yeah, that's normal. Which, again, is an issue. So, even though... NASCAR is making the proper steps in terms of trying to be on the right side of this fight. This situation still goes to show they still have some steps to take. Just because that should have, in theory, never been there in the first place. Like, once you, once anybody would have seen again, I don't know how much, how many times people were just in at the Talladega Speedway or how many times they've been there since October. But if there have been if there's even been one person in there that saw that and was just like, yeah, that's fine, like that's a part of the problem. So they've been they're doing the right thing with their messaging and their backing and bubble and all that stuff. But again, there still needs to be maybe some stuff internally that they still need to work on, just because that shouldn't be a normal thing that we just let uh, go by the wayside on an everyday basis. And then again, they need to continue, as I mentioned on last episode, continue to support. Bubba, and I guess anybody else that goes through anything, again, not that he's the only one that's going to go through anything um, this year, but you know, when it comes to these these racial issues, you need to continue to support him, because this is, again, the stance you've taken, it's kind of like when the NFL took the anti-kneeling stance, like, once you take that stance, you're kind of stuck, um, well, I mean, I guess, unless you're just going to flip-flop in four years, because now it's acceptable to kneel. Like I said, once they decide that this is the stance we're going to take, like we're going to be anti-kneeling as a league, like you kind of can't go back and forth because then it just looks weird. That's why, again, a lot of people think their messaging now is disingenuous. just that like, oh, it's a cool thing to do now to be like, yeah, we're pro-kneeling. So then, like, it, it looks bad. At least with NASCAR, they need to stay consistent with their messaging if they're going to do this. If they're going to fight for this and fight for these rights, then they need to continue to fight for these rights because, again, this is not just something you decide – like, all right, I've, I'm done fighting after this. Like, no, it's not that simple. Because, again, guys like Bubbler or other African Americans or people of color, um, people throughout this country or um, just other people or other groups of people that are discriminated against, they, they can't turn that off, that part of them off. So if you want to be an ally and help them in this, you, or you also can't turn it off, your support for them or fighting for them. It's just not something you can just be like, all right, I've done my part. I'm done now. Cause it's not, it's not over and until it's over, like you can't be like that until it's over and it's not going to be over anytime soon. So like I said, great for NASCAR to be so sh- strong in their stance. Still weird that it was there regardless of how and when it was there. Still weird. Um, but like I said, they're going to need to continue to do this because if they want to continue getting the support from these newer, younger, more progressive fans, these are the kind of stances they're going to have to continue to make because this is not going to be the last time something like this happens, especially when you have guys that are actively fighting for their right to have the Confederate flag at their races. So, yeah. But 
in a little bit. I mean, it depends on um, your your feelings towards this, but in a bit of happier news, Vince Carter has now officially called it a career. A great player, one of the all time dunkers, but he's called it quits. So we're kind of going to talk. Also, I'm going to talk about that. Talk about his career a little bit, and talk about what I'm not. I think he's going to get into the Hall of Fame. Whether or not I think he should get in the Hall of Fame, and also, is it like how easy is it to get into the Basketball Hall of Fame? We'll discuss all those things right after the break. Stay right there. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. Vince Carter officially calls it a career. He he hadn't really talked about it since the whole coronavirus thing hit and the NBA season was suspended March 11th, I believe, um, was the official date. But he hadn't really touched on it. Um, and obviously the Hawks, I mean, the, the team's not that good this year. So they weren't brought back for the Disney Invitational. So, I mean, their season is over. And with that... He decided to announce on his podcast, the um, Wing It with Vince Carter that um, is on the ringer. He said that he's officially done playing basketball professionally. Carter had initially, I mean, he had initially announced that, uh, I think this was last year, when he signed his one-year deal with the Hawks, that in 2019-2020, that would be his final season. I said he hadn't touched on it since, and now, see, now this isn't touching on it. So, he's done. Uh... Yeah, um, Carter acknowledged on the podcast that the abrupt ending was tough, but he emphasized that he is at peace with his decision to retire, especially against the backdrop of the pandemic. If there was any disappointment because of the season, any of that, it was kind of easier to put it aside and handle it that way, Carter said. It's like, okay, it's something bigger than my career. It's unfortunate, but with the coronavirus taking people's lives rapidly, that's the bigger picture in mind. So I was able to put the weird ending, the abrupt stoppage of playing, to an ending, Aside, um, aside for the bigger picture, um, Commissioner Adam Silver said in a statement that Vince Carter has made an in, indelible impact on the NBA with his remarkable skill and enduring commitment, and he called him a true ambassador of the game. Carter is currently 19th all-time in NBA history in scoring and was a 1999 Rookie of the Year. He averaged 16 points. Per game, it's sixteen point seven. Excuse me, points per game, and played on eight different teams during the course of his career. Most notably, with the Raptors and the Nets. Regarded as one of the best dunkers of all time, he won a slam dunk contest in twenty two thousand, and he also made an NBA history earlier this year when he became the first NBA player to appear in at least one game in four decades. So yeah, when you look at Vince Carter's career. He finished as, I believe, an eight-time All-Star. An eight-time All-Star, two-time All-NBA player, and the Rookie of the Year. Obviously, he had highlight moments with the uh, the Raptors before he straight to the Nets. Then he had some good seasons with the Nets, though, unfortunately, none of those included those, uh, their final years. So obviously, he got to there after all of that. But um, he... Uh, I mean, he averaged 20 points per game for about, I'm trying to see, what's that? 
like seven, eight straight seasons from 99, 2000 to 2008, 2009. He averaged 20 points per game every season. So that's from age 23 to age 32. Pretty impressive. Um, had career highs in 2000, 2011, 2000, 2001, excuse me, and where he averaged 27.6, along with five rebounds, four assists, shot um, 46% from the field, 40% from three. He's also like a, uh, I mean, you kind of don't think about it, but he's a pretty solid three-point shooter over the course of his career. He shot 37% um, over, again, the course of his 22 seasons, had some memorable uh, game winners. I think they were, what was the one in the playoffs? I think it was when he was on the Mavs. Yeah, this was like, uh, this was, or was it Mavs or was it the Grizz? I think it was the Mavs that he had the, the game winner. Oh, I'm in the playoffs. It was kind of a cool moment. And even his last moment in the NBA was kind of cool. And shout out to whoever on the Hawks was like, oh, um, I mean, granted, no one really knew exactly what was going to happen with this whole pandemic situation. So no one knew for certain that they weren't ever going to be able to come back like as a whole um, league. But shout out to whoever was like, hey, we need to put Vince back in there just in case. Because then obviously he got his last moment in there, got the great state innovation. I think he did a three, too, um, if I remember correctly. It's kind of one last, like, hurrah for his career, which was, like, like I said, it was a cool moment. I mean, they were going to lose the game. I think they were down. They were playing the Knicks. So they were going to lose the game. They were down, like, seven, I think, at the time, or whatever. It was, like, 20 seconds left. Um, got uh, the uh, funny. He was, um, I think, at the free throw line when he subbed in. He was talking with R.J. Barrett, which is just kind of the the, the weird, uh, not a weird side, but I'm just interesting just because even just, like, just a juxtaposition of them. RJ, a young guy at 19, uh, Vince Carter, and, and the old grizzled veteran at 43. And kind of like that was, that was one of his last moments in the league. And like I said, shout out to everyone on the Hawks who had the wherewithal to be like, hey, um, they just have to cancel games, so like we might not play for a while. So let's just make sure Vince gets one last moment. Because again, they didn't have to put him in. So good on whoever on the Hawks. I don't know if it was a player, it was a coach, whoever. It was the first one to realize, like, hey, we need to get Vince back in the game. Just, like, just to be safe. Shout out to them. But as we talked about, when you look over the course of his career, I mean, I think, I'm trying to think if he, let me actually check that out. If he ever, um, what does MVP award shares ever look like? Um, so he's never really in contention for like an MVP. It doesn't seem like, um, the all NBA teams he made, uh, he made, Third team in 99-2000, and then second team in 2000-2001. So, I mean, that, that makes sense. But um, outside of that, like I said, it's, it's hard to say for certain. Like, he's going to get into the Hall of Fame because, again, the NBA Hall of Fame is very easy. Or, cause, well, it's not the NBA. It's the Basketball Hall of Fame, and that's why it's so easy to get into. Um, but, I mean, that's uh, we'll get into that in a second. But he's going to get in. Just because, I mean, he has the he has the whole dunking thing. Again, he's I would maybe have a debate on like best like dunker period, but like surely in games. I mean, whenever you jump over a seven two guy, even though that wasn't an NBA games in the Olympics, you clear a seven two guy. I'm sorry, I'd give you the title for best in game dunker because no one's done that. I mean, people have tried. I know Giannis jumped over. I think it was Tim Hardaway Jr. a couple of years ago. Um, LeBron cleared, I think his name was John Lucas on the Bulls on an alley-oop. So people have jumped over people. He's not the first one, but no one jumped over a guy at 7-2 that was standing in the paint on a fast break in the middle of a game. So, bar none, the best in-game dunker. Now, again, I would say, I know I had this debate with my dad, like, dunk contest? I mean, did he have the best solo perform- performance? Probably. With, I think it was, the, what, the 2000 dunk contest? Um, but I mean, the best dunk contest of all time, in my opinion, is the, I think it was 2016, the one between Aaron Gordon and Zach Levine, um, where, I mean, Aaron Gordon probably could make a claim that he should have won. He didn't. Um, Zach Levine, I mean, once you go, I think he went like between his legs from the free throw line. Like, I'm sorry, once you do that, you're going to lose. I mean, well, you're going to win. Excuse me. The, your opponent's going to lose. It is what it is. Even though, uh, the, the, um, the Aaron Gordon two leg underneath, over the mascot, plus the like spinning when the guy, uh, the mascot was on the hoverboard, spinning, he kind of scooped it up with one hand and dunked it in like the like a three sixty windmill motion. Like 
those are arguably the two best dunks of the contest. But I mean, again, you go between your legs on the free throw line. It, you're going, you're going to win. So I would argue that's the best dunk contest ever. So it's hard to say for sorry. And is he the best overall dunker? But in game, I'll give you that. And and that was my that was gonna be my point is that like with the Hall of Fame thing, he's gonna get in because again he's a good guy, made enough All Star games was it was a good score all that stuff. But like how many times were you like wow Vince Carter one of the best players in the league? I mean he made second team once so he was at least like the third or fourth best guard in the league which again. That's good, but outside of that, he only made two All NBA teams. Like that doesn't that doesn't scream Hall of Famer. Eight All Star games, not bad, but I mean, I could look up. Let me just look up someone. I know I mentioned him before. Let's look up somebody like Al Horford. Al Horford has been to five All Star games. Was on an All NBA team once and then on an All Defensive team. And he's like, no one would even consider him for the All of Fame. But isn't like, I mean, again, his, his scoring stats are much worse. And he's probably not going to play 22 seasons. But like, I mean, like just like being an All-Star does not qualify you in the, in um, the, there's a guarantee to be in the Hall of Fame. I know, I think it was Bomani on Around the Horn. He compared him to like that, like Chris Webber type NBA career, where it's like, it was like a good, like you're a solid player, you're a good player, not really like, you're not going to be in a top, anyone's like top five at their position, or anything like that, but, um, but still, like I said, it's just because the Basketball Hall of Fame is so easy to get into, mainly because it doesn't just qualify for the NBA, which is a weird distinction for me, because every other sport, like even the NFL, you could argue, some people argue it's easy to get into, but there's a separate one for NFL and college. MLB, I guess they they can kind of st- counter overseas stats, but even like guys that have come from overseas and played well at each or all, like he he still had like three thousand hits over here. So of course he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna get it and stuff like that. Um, but I'm saying like like they have their own separate one. Basketball is the only one that just has like the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. I'm pretty sure is what it's called. Um, I think Naismith Naismith yeah. Naismith Memorial. Let me just double check that to make sure that it's Naismith Memorial. Yeah, Basketball Hall of Fame. But yeah, so that includes um, that includes uh, professional, includes college, includes overseas. So you include all that plus again his impact on the game and all the things he's going to get in. But I mean, is he like a lock? Should he be like a surefire lock? Probably not. In my opinion, again, he was great in Toronto, very good during his four or five years on the Nets. But, like, if you even look at the best guards of his era, which is, like, a weird time frame because, like, he came in the league in, what, 98? So, I mean, he's around Kobe's time, not better than Kobe. He's played in AIs. I mean, A is a weird one because you don't know if he's a one or a two, but he's, like, a combo guard. Not better than AI. Not better than Dwayne Wade. Um, and that's just the people that kind of played in the same era as him. He's not better than all time than obviously Jordan. He's not better all time than I would even give James Harden's probably has a better uh, claim for like a top shooting guard than he does. I mean, he's the same thing. So he's what? He's 30 now. He's already been on eight all star teams, has been to a scoring champ twice, won an all star. I mean, an MVP, a sixth man of the year, six-time All-NBA, an assist champion, and was on an all-rookie team. Like, that's, you know what I'm saying? He could retire right now, and you'd be like, yeah, okay, yeah, he could probably get in the Hall of Fame. And again, he's averaged, what, 30 points three straight years, and the one year he averaged, one of the years he averaged 29, he also averaged 11.2 assists. While, sh- like, again, while putting up great, Good numbers across the board, like free throw percentage, uh, uh, three point percentage, stuff like that. Well, not great from three. He's like an arrow. He's like a career like thirty six percent. But again, when you're shooting nine and ten and thirteen and twelve attempts per game, unless you're Steph Curry, um, you know those guys aren't going to shoot forty percent on those kind of numbers. But regardless, 
Um, look at him like that. He like he's not. I don't know if he's gonna end up being better than him. Like there's a lot of guys. He might not even be better than. Oh, T Mac. That's another good one. Uh, T Mac is um, Tracy McGrady. He's what? He's in the Hall of Fame, which again, debatable. But he's seven time All NBA, which is a, which is a lot more than uh, Vince, obviously. Seven time All Star, which is a little, which is I guess one less. Two time scoring champ, one of the most improved. So I mean, his injury, his career is a little bit different because he obviously had a lot of injuries um, over the latter part of his career, which kind of hurt him. Because I mean, basically from twenty eight on, he never played a full season. The most he ever played from from after two thousand six two thousand seven was seventy two games, and that was with Detroit. Like he was out of the league by thirty two. Oh no, no way. He was on the, what happened to the one year he was on the Spurs? That don't count. Oh, no, nah, basketball reference, they were they playing. Well, maybe I know he wasn't really, like, playing like that. But I remember he, I was a room for him to get that ring before Ray Allen went and ruined that. Um, but I guess he, they said he played in China that year. Regardless. It's like him. Like, he's in the, like, Jason McGrady's in the Hall of Fame. Not to say that he shouldn't, because he's, again, seven-time All-NBA, seven-time All-Star. That's, that's good enough, but... I mean, was he even a better... I mean, he's a small forward shooting guard, depending on how you position it. Um, but, I mean, is he even better than Vince Carter? Cause, I mean, they're both, like, scores, really. Obviously, Vince is a better dunker. But that's my point, is that, like, should he be a lock? Probably not. But is he a lock? Yeah, because you can everybody can get into the basketball Hall of Fame. I don't say anybody. You got to be at least decent level good. But if you make, I think, if you make at least six all-star games and... And like a couple all NBA teams, I feel like you they they might find a way to squeeze. And you're like a good person, like people like you. I feel like you can find a way to squeeze in there. But regardless of that, he's gonna have a good post playing career. He's he's done a lot of. I know he's been calling like summer league games um, over the past couple of years. He's he's he is he's a good he's a good talker. Obviously, he has his own podcast, so he's been working on that, getting in the media swing of things. So he'll be fine. But it was just it was just uh, curious. I mean, not curious. It was just like, hey, you know, shout out to him. Had a good career. You knew it was kind of coming to an end at this point. I mean, he's, what, 43, so, I mean, you're not going to play forever. But at least he got the one last moment. That's, that's the one thing I'm happy about is he didn't, like, end his career not being able to have, like, the last moment. Like, he was able to get in, get in at the end even even though he wasn't really, like, in, in like that. But you get the point. Like, he was able to get that one last NBA moment instead of just having to be, like, his last moment just sitting on the bench as time ran out of the loss of the Knicks. Which is like its own sad story, but and shout out to Vince Carter again, the best in-game dunker I've ever seen. So cool, and he he helped keep the Nets relevant in New Jersey before they decided they were going to move to Brooklyn. So appreciate that as well, because at least gave me something to cheer for when I was a child. So shout out to him. So next, after we come back from this break, we are going to discuss golf a little bit. I mean, I know it's like, ooh, I mean. There's not a whole lot going on, people. But um, uh, with golf, I know there there have been some people that are that are pulling out of tournaments ahead of time, even if they haven't tested positive. Um, and that just kind of got me thinking of how that could kind of affect how these sports, other sports that are getting ready to return um, very soon, or maybe even trying to return down the line, like the NFL, how that could change the way things are handled with them when they try when they come back. Just because I mean, people are pulling out. Even after they return, like if, like as you would think, yeah, but like I said, I don't get too far into it because we'll get into it after the break. So stay right there. We'll be right back. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info.
Brooks Kepka and Webb Simpson were among five players who withdrew from the Travelers Championship, four of them out of a chain reaction abundance of caution over the coronavirus that put the PGA Tour on notice. The snowball is getting a little bigger, Graham McDowell told the Associated Press after withdrawing Wednesday because his longtime caddy, Ken Comboy, hopefully I pronounced that right, uh, tested positive for the virus. The tour released results that showed three positive tests at TPC River Highlands in Connecticut, Cameron Champ and the caddies for Kepka and McDowell. There were no positive tests on the Corn Ferry Tour event in Utah. As it enters the third week in its return from the COVID-19 pandemic that shut down golf for three months, the tour had administered almost 3,000 tests at the at PGA Tour and Corn Ferry Tour events in five states with seven positive results. On the PGA Tour alone, there have been about 1,400 tests and four positive results. It's a low number on a percentage basis, but every number hurts, PGA Tour Commissioner Jay Monahan said. I think we need, we, I think we all need to remind ourselves that we're all learning to live with the virus. It's pretty clear that the virus isn't going anywhere, which, I mean, if, again, if you're seeing this, the spikes around the country, you're already aware. Uh, Nick Watney was the first player to test positive last week at the RBC Heritage in, in Holton Head Island, South Carolina, which was teaming with people on summer vacation. Champ tested positive Tuesday at the Travelers and immediately withdrew. Four, four more players withdrew, even with negative test results. Kepka said his caddy, Ricky Elliott, tested positive and then took another test that came back negative. No matter, he chose to with, withdraw and was especially gutted that his younger brother, Chase Kepka withdrew after earning a rare chance to play through a Monday qualifier. Um, both Kepkas said they felt they should withdraw because they were in close contact with someone who was positive, which is um, very fair. And obviously, Kep- uh, Brooks Kepka felt bad for his um, for his brother, just because, uh, just because obviously he was going to get a chance to play in a situation he normally wouldn't have, and he chose not to because again, the whole Rona is messing everything up. Uh, Simpson won the RBC Heritage last week with a record score that moved him to number five in the world. Withdrew when he learned a family member had tested positive. Monahan said the tour would continue and that there was no set number of positive tests that would lead to golf shutting down. So, and I mean, the, the, the article goes on to say some more things, but my main takeaway from this is that if a sport that should be, I mean, next to probably baseball, it should be one of the easiest sports of socially distancing. Like, all right, you... And guess what? At most, you have four people going at one time. Everyone can kind of stand away from each other. One person hits the ball. The next person comes up. So on and so forth. They can walk separate from each other. And even if they're walking with their caddy, they can have space between them and, the, them and their caddy. Um, as they walk between holes or like, take the cart between holes or whatever. And even still, in that sport, there are still people testing positive, though. As you mentioned with the Nick Montney situation, the... Uh, in the South Carolina event, they were just people all over. Just no mask, no nothing. So, that might have been the reason. Because, again, you have to go out and get food, go to the store, uh, do things like that. So, you can't just, like, it's not, like, since they're not in a bubble, they have to go out amongst regular people. And if that's the case, then you're going to be around um, people that may or may not be taking it as seriously as you do, the virus that is. And then you may put yourself at risk of testing positive, which obviously happened here. But... But the, like I said, the bigger point is that as sports, like the NBA, which is a close contact sport, as sports like even, well, WNBA, obviously, hockey, the NHL, the MLS, to a degree, you got to be near people if you're both going for the ball at the same time. Like, that's not, it's not always, but like, it's going to happen. And then obviously, once we get to like the NFL and stuff, like, that's, that's a pretty clear one. Um, all these sports are coming back, and a lot of them involve being, near other people at least at some point during the match or the game so if a sport like golf can't keep their golfers healthy and again the NBA is the only one that's really going I guess the WNBA too I know they're going down to IMG in Florida which is a separate 
issue because why are you going to Florida now? But I digress. Um, if they can't socially distance properly and keep the people safe, how do we expect any sport to do it? Like, honestly. And I've kind of been on this. I've kind of been a downer like, oh, Chris, why do you always say, like, we shouldn't play sports? Because we shouldn't. That's why I say it. Like, I am not of the belief that you can't go out and live your life, per se. Like, I know I'm going to get a haircut next week for the first time in, like, over three months. Yeah, well, well, obviously over three months now. Um, So, again, and I've been to the grocery store, um, gone out, I go, like, run sometimes. So, it's not, I just stay in the, I mean, I've I picked up things to eat, like, fast food or whatever. Like, I've, I've left the house over the last three months. So, I understand that you can't just, like, completely shut down. But from a perspective of why I leave my house, outside of, like, the, well, even the running, you know, got to make sure... Uh, my lungs are at uh, peak performance in case I come down with the run. Although, separate point, I think I already had it, but that was back in March. Um, before brothers really knew, like, if COVID was that serious, I was taking the train into the city, New York City, that is, every day. So, I'm, like, uh, 99% sure I had it. Especially now knowing that New York was one of the epicenters. And I know during the time, because you saw some people wearing masks, some people weren't, no one really knew how serious to take it. And, like, I get sick, and then the next week is when all sports shut down. Well, I was still sick, but all sports shut down. So I was like, oh, okay. I think maybe we should be taking this seriously. Um, so, yeah, I was sick for, like, a week and a half, too. It was bad. Um, I'm usually not... I'm not saying I don't ever get sick, but, like, I usually don't get sick for that long. And it was, like, weird because I was like, medicine wasn't really helping that much. So I was like, that's, like, kind of strange. But whatever. I just figured it was the common cold. But I don't really get, like, the flu either, like, most years. And I don't even... And then regardless of if I get a flu shot or not kind of like rant um I mean, this is kind of like a, a rant again just like quick sidebar but you know i do this all the time so you guys know this already um but yeah so um i was sick for at least like a week and a half it was the only thing i didn't really have was like the shortness of breath like the loss of like s- smell or taste or everything but like everything else like the fever cough uh like chills sometimes like all that other like most of the other symptoms you you go on and list them off i had them and like i said this was back in march before people really knew what it was luckily no one else in my family well i don't know if no one else in my family ever caught it but they didn't have the symptoms i had so good for them but regardless if golf can't properly keep people safe how's any sport going to do it because when you look at the nfl is not going to do a bubble because it's not feasible at least i don't think they're going to do a bubble they talked about it before it just doesn't seem feasible Honestly, there's just, there's no real place to play. We have enough fields to keep everybody isolated. So they're going to be having people traveling. And again, they're going to be testing all the time, which is great. But they still got to be out and about in their cities. Who knows how seriously the cities are going to be taking it by by July. I mean, I mean, Texas is taking it more seriously now than they were before, which is wild because like, it's not like it's, I mean, it's, maybe it's a little bit more advanced. We know a little bit more now, but we knew mass social distancing was the way before. Texas were just like, nah, we're all we're all right. Same thing with Florida. They're like, nah, we're good. We're not New York. And now New York's out here banning states. So that that's that part of it's kind of funny. But um the other thing I wanted to bring up was the fact that like people that came back to the sport knowing like, all right, you you didn't know exactly how bad it was gonna be. But you knew like, all right, there was some inherent risk with me playing at this moment right now. And there Deciding like, ooh, I need to test positive, but let me just like, eh, let me not, let me not play this weekend. And I'm just curious to see if some of that will happen when, when the sports come back, because obviously we know it's not gonna, they're not gonna be able to keep everybody healthy the whole time. It's just not, not completely feasible. I mean, we've seen NBA starting to test people now as they um, prepare to head down to Orlando, which is the funniest thing. Like NBA players like testing positive, like, oh yeah, they'll be fine for Orlando, like. One, you don't know that. Um, and two, they we're starting to hear stories now about people testing positive again. Don't really, I've never seen, we haven't seen as many stories, people having like really bad symptoms and then being, then recovering, then getting really bad symptoms again. We haven't seen too much of that, but people have tested positive multiple times. Like, again, like far apart, not like immediately, but like, like they, they've been away and then they end up getting testing positive again. Now, you know, it could be the whole like false positive thing, but in this case, assuming it's not, 
And, like, I know, because that was some people's belief, like, oh, yeah, if they get you now, like, that'll be good. Like, they'll have it and they'll be good. Like, maybe. But, like, also, we don't know. And also, like, because that's the other thing is, like, it seems like the antibodies last a little bit longer if you're symptomatic. But a lot of these players are, or have been at least asymptomatic. So, who knows if in a month, if they come across it again, if... If they'll have the proper antibodies to fight it off, or if they'll be asymptomatic again, like maybe this time they'll be symptomatic. You, there's so much uncertainty with the virus still, even as we continue on. So I'm just curious to see, like, if they will, if that'll happen, if there'll be people who'll be like, hey, all right, I'm gonna try to come down, hope for the best, and then, like you see a couple people on your team getting, you're just like, you know what, I'm good. Especially if you're on like those bottom tier teams, or you're not like you're not on the Lakers, you're not on the Bucks, you're not on the Clippers, you're not on the Raptors, Nuggets teams like the top half of their conference where it's you have a good shot of making it to an NBA finals potentially like if you're if you're a person on like the I mean you already saw people on the Wizards decide that they weren't going to come back but say if you're on like the Spurs and like you see a couple people get it and you're like four games and you're just like you know what I'm good I don't need I don't need to do this right now anymore but you, you came down you're going to try to see you thought it was a decent idea but now you're just like you know what I'm good and I'm curious if that's going to happen too because that's for whatever reasons, I never really thought about that possibility of, like, people going down there and then deciding, like, you know what? I'm going to drop out. Like, I'm good. Again, it's different for golf because they're just dropping out of the tournament, per se. It doesn't mean that they're, like, not playing golf anymore. But to the same degree, like, they were, they came back, they were playing, and then all of a sudden people test positive, and you're just like, eh, you know what? Let, let me Let me chill out. Even though I tested negative. Even though I don't necessarily have it. I've been around people that have it, but I don't have it yet, at least. Because who knows when you'll be, you'll develop the symptoms or maybe you'll never develop symptoms. Who knows? But it's like, they're like, you know what? I'm good. I don't need to be playing right now. So I wonder if people, and also I guess another thing will be people, will will people be that courteous or that like considerate of the others around them? Will they be like, oh, I was with this person, but like I test negative, so I'm going to keep playing. Like I wonder Again, how serious people are going to take this disease once these leagues do start up. Because just because you don't test positive does not mean you don't have it. Or it's not in you some way and you can't spread it to somebody else. So I'm just I'm just, I'm just, going to be curious to see, like, once these leagues do start back up, will you see people be like, even if they don't have because obviously they have it and they, they have no choice. But if they don't have it, they're just like, eh, you know what, let me, let me chill. I think it's a real possibility. And I... For whatever reason, I hadn't thought of it, but like I think there's a good chance that you're going to see some of that. We're just like, you know what? This isn't worth it. And I said, especially with the NBA, with the whole, like the the whole weird playoff thing. Like, if you're not going to get into that playoff, like the the the, the playoff um, games for like the eighth stop spot, like what are like what am I really doing down there? Like if I'm the Suns and the first couple games don't really go our way, like if you pack it up and just like you know what, I'm out, peace. I wouldn't even blame you. It's like, what's the, like, what is the point of staying down there and risk getting the Rona and bringing it back with you to your area? Though, I mean, in fairness, if I'm in Arizona, I would want to leave because then I know their situation is kind of bad. But I wouldn't want to go to Florida, though, but that's a different story. Um, but yeah, so just like, you know, I'm just, it's this, this whole thing with sports is a mess. And while I appreciate why the sports are going to happen, I've said before, I've pretty much been saying from the beginning, and I'll say now, there's no safe way to do it, there's no point, and it doesn't really seem like there's a safe way. Because all it takes is one of these athletes to, especially some of these, especially when we get the NFL, these guys a little bit bigger, might have, like, different, like, breathing issues, whether it's not, whether it's, like, asthma or, like, sleep apnea or something like that. And like I said, something like the off line stuff, there may be a little bit overweight where they might be affected a little bit differently than like your typical basketball player that's generally in like great shape like now we're starting to get a little risky and all it takes is one you don't want to be the sport where someone gets it really bad and either is near death or ends up dying because then then you got then everything's going to get shut down again but you don't want to be that sport and it seems like all these sports are going to try and hope it's not them and like i said i don't want it to happen i really pray that it doesn't but if, if you're out there there's a risk so We'll see how it goes, but yeah, this whole soul sports thing is a bit of a mess. But when we come back here, 
Um, since I, like I mentioned with the football and stuff, um, that's another season that's getting ready to start back up. And with that, I thought I would discuss, uh, which teams, kind of think I've done like players and stuff, but like which teams, if they didn't make the conference championship, at least. Super Bowl, again, that's, that's, that's tough because only one team makes it. But if you don't make the conference championship, at least, which teams would that season be the biggest failure for? And I kind of drank them. Probably just do like a top five like I normally do. Um, but yeah. So we'll discuss that right after the break. Stay right there. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Podcast Network. So I thought about doing this for the AFC as well in like the next episode, but just looking across the teams, there's not that many teams that like it's a failure, the AFC wise, if they don't make a championship game. Like outside the Chiefs and the Ravens, like no one really is like, oh my god, if they don't make a deep playoff on this year, like it's a disaster. Even like the Bills, who many people think should be the top team in the AFC East, like if Josh Allen just wins a playoff game, like that's like a good step for them. You don't need him to get to a championship or get to a Super Bowl. As opposed to the Ravens, like, I mean, Lamar Jackson, my boy. But you got to start winning a playoff game at some point. Been in two playoff games, haven't won any. Not, and again, I'm not a big, like, playoff or quarterback wins guy. Like, he has an MVP. Like, who cares? But I'm just saying for his detractors, it's always going to be like, oh, see, like, that style works in the regular season, but you can't win the playoffs, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, again, until he starts winning, he won't be able to shake that. Um, and then, like, Mahomes is, like, whatever. He's won a Super Bowl. No one cares. Um, but, yeah, like I'm saying, outside of those two, like, no, like, what other team, if you look at the AFC, please let me know. Um, like I said, let me know on, like, Twitter or or where or wherever. Put in the YouTube comments, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, it's, like, outside of the Chiefs and the Ravens, like, there's no team in the AFC where you're just like, wow, if they don't make this uh, conference championship or a Super Bowl this year, like, this season's a complete disaster. So, I wasn't able to do it for the AFC, but... You look at the NFC. That's where things get a little bit more interesting. So, I was thinking of going by division, per se. But I think I'm just going to go, like, my top teams. And, like, I'm going to work my way down. So, I'll probably do five. Even though I think there's a probably, you could list, I think you could list a good seven or eight. Maybe even more, depending on how you view on the Rams. Um, where like they don't get to the conference championship, maybe not a Super Bowl, but at least a conference championship. Like this season's probably at least fan base wise. Again, internally, I I think obviously every team wants to win a Super Bowl, but I don't think they judge it as harshly as fans do. Like I mean, say for like the Eagles last year, like even though they, they didn't win a playoff game, I figure the way that they came back towards the end of that season with all the young guys and practice squad guys and guys off the street and persevered through all the injuries. Like that's is it a great season? No, but it's like a it's a it's a quality season. It's a season that you can't be like that upset about. As uh, as opposed to someone like I mean, even like the Cowboys. Like I like Dak had a great year, so Cowboys fans aren't like oh huh. they they're not like over like wow this was a terrible year. I mean, granted they they didn't want Jason Jason Garrett to be their coach anymore, but outside of that, they weren't like overly upset. They're like oh Dak played well. We didn't win championship. We didn't win. Um, didn't get to the playoffs. Like they, I don't know that many Cowboys fans that were like so so beat up over the fact. 
mainly because he was lost in the playoffs. But still, you would think if you go eight and eight and lose the biggest game of the season to a team that was starting practice squad guys, that should be considered a failure. But um, from the fan base perspective, I don't really think it was viewed that way. Which again, teach their own. But when I'm like I said, when I'm going through the teams. Um, at the top of the list has to be the Saints. It just has to be. And I say this for a lot of reasons, but mainly Drew Brees isn't getting any younger. He's, I think, well, I don't want to be wrong, but he's at least like 43. I don't want, no, no, she might be younger. Cause I think, I think Tom's 43. Drew Brees is 41. He's 41. He wants him 42 till next January, but still he's 41. Um, so again, not getting any younger. He's only on, I think, a one-year deal. So who knows who their quarterback could be next year? Maybe Taysom Hill, maybe Jameis Winston, maybe somebody else, for all we know, um, depending on how good the season goes for the Saints. But th- he's not getting younger. They only have so many shots at this left. Him and Peyton only have sh- uh, Sean Payton only have so many shots at this left. And also, you could argue they have top to bottom one of the best rosters, if not the best roster in football. Like, there's not really very many weaknesses, if any, honestly, on their roster outside of maybe, like, I don't, I don't even know, like, offensive line. The offensive line style. They got two bookends at, um, at tackle with Armstead and Ramchak. Uh, I know they signed Pete to an extent, even though some Saints fans are a little shaky on that. Um, Eric McCoy was good for them. And I think then they just, they just drafted, they drafted what Cesar Ruiz too from Michigan. So, I mean, maybe he could slide to guard McCork side to guard, who knows? Um, but he was arguably the best like non tackle lineman in the draft. Arguably well, definitely the best center, at least rated wise. I don't, I don't grade linemen, but just from the analysts and quote unquote experts. So he got him. So it's like, all right, like like I said, that it's hard. You're hard pressed to find a spot where they're weaker. They got a number two receiver now. Um, like the like, where are the holes on their roster? They, there's, like I said, it's, they're very far and few between. So, with that being said, they have they have not made a Super Bowl since they went to the Super Bowl and won the Super Bowl back. I guess what was it? I don't even know how long it's been. Like oh nine, oh eight, oh nine, something like that. Let me let me double check. Uh, when Drew Brees won the Super Bowl, but they haven't been back since. They, I mean, they were in the conference championship a couple years ago. Should have won, but then you know the whole pass interference thing. So I mean, stuff happens. Um, but yeah, so it's just one of those things where, um, was it? I think it was '09, right? I'm just on double check. Yeah, no, okay, it was 2009. That's when they won. So they haven't been back in over 10 years. It's kind of a problem. And in the past three years, they've been knocked out quarterback-wise by Case Keenum, Jared Goff, and Kirk Cousins. Back to back to back. Not exactly a murderer's row of quarterbacks. Again, Kirk Cousins and Jared Goff aren't terrible. But not exactly a murderer's row. It's not they're going through Brady and Mahomes and Peyton Manning and all those guys every year. Like they're Russell Wilson, ah, excuse me, Russell Wilson, Aaron Rodgers. Like they're not going through the creme de la creme of the quarterback position, but they're still finding ways to lose. Um, and each way is more devastating than, I mean, um, yeah, no, I say more devastating than the last. I mean, at the Minneapolis Miracle, you got, um, you got the, obviously, you no know, pass interference thing. And then this last and most recent one, you got Kirk Cousins driving down the game and getting his signature playoff win against you in the dome. So, like I said, they are definitely top of the list of teams that if they don't at least get their conference championship, it's, this season has to be a disaster. And... I would say probably number two would have to be like the 49ers only because they were there last year. If you get to a Super Bowl, you have a pretty much a young team. You bring back a lot of the same core. Obviously, they don't have DeForest Buckner anymore, but they got Armstead. They drafted Ken Law. Still got Bosa. Still got D Ford. Quan Alexander will hopefully be healthy for the whole year. Maybe they'll trade for Jamal Adams. Possibility. Um, Jimmy D's back. Move for another year in that offense. Obviously, Debo being hurt, though it should be fine by week one ish. We'll see. Um, but that him being hurt, and then obviously, no Emmanuel Sanders that hurts a little bit. I still got Kittle, traded Breed if they didn't even need him. That's not like how good their running back situation is. And he's like a very solid running back, they didn't even need him. Um, just so they have Coleman, they have Mostert, they have Jarek McKinnon coming back from injury, 
potentially this year, who knows. But regardless of stuff, Mozart and Coleman. And you didn't need three running backs. Um so yeah, Kyle Hands, in my opinion, one number one, if not number two play caller, play designer, schemer in the league. The only person you'd be behind is Andy Reid, in my opinion. Um so yeah, so I'm saying you have all that in place. You expect to get back there. Maybe even get all the hump win at this time, hold on to the lead. So if they don't get there, at least the conference championship, I would probably you have to consider that at least somewhat of a failure. Again, how it happens, you have to watch it play out. But for them, I have to consider it somewhat of a failure. Um, I don't three and four are probably interchangeable because they're both going to be two teams from the same division. No, take that back. Um, third team will be Cowboys, just because. Um, Again, you got all the pieces in place. You got Dak. He's not signed to an extension yet. He's he, he probably will be by the time the season starts. But if even if he's not, he's still on the franchise tag, getting paid thirty million dollars, getting paid the big bucks now. So now, all right, all that like fourth round pick, um, cheap contract stuff is out the window. He's getting paid like one of the best quarterbacks in the league. So now he has to go and prove. And not that he hasn't throughout his career, but um, they need to show something. Um, in terms of playoffs, because he's won, I think, one playoff game in the two times he's made it. Again, I'm not a big quarterback wins stat guy, but just from their perspective, they haven't been to a conference championship game in over 20 years, haven't been to a Super Bowl in over 20 years. And at some point, like all these high draft picks that you got, all these people that you've given extensions to, they have to warrant it in some way. And not to say they haven't warranted it, because they've had good regular seasons and stuff, but at the same time, you've got to be able to, um, you've got to be able to um, come through when it matters most, and that's usually end of the season, and slash or the playoffs. So, um, for them, I think even though, like I said, the defense is going to be a little interesting. You got a new head coach. Um, see how Mike McCarthy adjusts, and or they adjust to Mike McCarthy. And like I said, they let Byron Jones go. No Robert Quinn this year. Um, so, like I said, they got some shuffling to do on, on defense side. Hopefully, Van Der Esch's neck is all right, which could be a big deal. Um, so, got some things to work out on the defensive side, in my opinion. But offense should be all there. I got CeeDee Lamb to go with Gallup and Amari Cooper. Like, you would think they they should be fine on that side. The ball still got Zeke. They lost um, Frederick, but got Tyler Bidash who was supposed to be a first or second round pick, but it's for whatever reason fell, I guess, inconsistencies inconsistencies in this game or what have you. But there are teams, so I'd probably put them like third, fourth Packers, because a similar thing to the Saints, just because Aaron Rodgers isn't getting that much younger. Again, he's not Drew Brees old, but he's not getting that much younger, and he's had, he's had more injuries, especially more recently than Drew Brees has had. Obviously, Drew Brees had the shoulder, but... Um, after that, he's been like pretty much healthy. I guess well, he hurt his thumb, but like that's like a one-off kind of thing. Like, Aaron Rodgers had some has had some uh, collarbone stuff. Like he's had some injuries um, throughout his career. That and plus, like a lot of his game, just being able to get out on the move a little bit, as opposed to Drew Brees, with more of his uh, pocket passer. Traditional, not that Aaron Rodgers isn't, but like his extending of plays is kind of what allows him to be Aaron Rodgers. So once that kind of fades you would think his game would fade with it. But, um, again, they were a team that went to the conference championship last year, um, finished 13-3, and even though, was it a fluky 13-3? and It's hard to say, because you win 13 games, you win 13 games, but, like, they weren't as good as their record claimed, in my opinion. Again, other people may disagree, but in my opinion, they weren't as good as their record stated they were. But, I mean, you are what your record says you are, so it's, it goes both ways. But yeah, they were a team in the conference championship game last year, so you would think, all right, boom, you 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 can continue on from that. But um, if they don't, and take a step back, and even if, and if who knows, they might not even win. Yeah, I don't know, like they should be the favorite in their division, but like I don't care. You got to see what the Vikings no at no, no uh, digs, and the defense going to require a lot of or rely on a lot of young guys, and then the Bears. Who knows what their quarterback's going to be? It should be Foles, but like they still might stick with Mitch. Who knows? The defense should be fine, but the offense still got some question marks. So the Packers should be the favorite, but I don't think they're anybody's favorite to get to the Super Bowl, in my opinion, at least, just because they didn't really do that much. They didn't get Drew Brees. Ah, Drew Brees. They didn't get Aaron Rodgers any help on the offense side. I mean, outside of 
AJ Dillon, who's like whatever. They have Aaron Jones. They don't really need him. Um, and they also have Jamal Williams, who can do what AJ Dillon. You would think, in theory, yeah, he's not as athletic, but in theory, he could. They serve the same purposes. And then, um, but yeah, didn't get him any help on the outside to opposite Devontae Adams. The defense uh, lost Blake Martinez, so don't know. He's a tackle guy, but again, he's not really the best in coverage. So we'll see how that kind of plays out. But that's a big loss. I mean, he's been the cog in the middle of their defense for years. So see how that goes. Um, and then fifth is an interesting one because there's a couple of teams you can go. You can go Seahawks, you can go Eagles, you can go Bucks. And I'm only going to go with the Bucks only because the Eagles still have some question marks, especially on the offensive side. Like, who knows outside of Deshaun who's, who their go to receivers are going to be. And I know they got Darius Slay. They should have a good defensive line. But they're, if you, I promise you, if you're not an Eagles fan and you can name three linebackers on their roster, I'll, like, give you $20. I promise you. Just because, like, the general public, I guarantee you, like, well, you have to, like, if you can prove to me that you're not, like, you didn't Google it. Like, if you just, if I came up to you and you weren't an Eagles fan and you get, and I told you name three linebackers on their roster and you got it, I would give you $20. Honestly. Because there's Eagles fans that don't know all the, the linebackers on their team. So, they still got a couple question marks. So, that's why I don't know if I... They, I mean, they're a team that they should be in contention for a Super Bowl. So, if they don't get there, it is a failure. And, and well, at least should be a failure, depending on how it goes. But I'm going to go with the Bucks only because of Tom Brady. Like, just because you don't sign Tom Brady to get to the playoffs. You get to the time, you sign Tom Brady, you think you can win a Super Bowl. Like, you think, all right, our defense is good enough. We got good enough offense. If our quarterback just doesn't throw 30 interceptions, we should be in contention. And, like I said, Drew, I mean, Tom Brady has what, one, potentially two seasons left. So, Tom Brady didn't go here because he thinks, all right, this is a good team to get me to the playoffs. He just wanted to get to the playoffs. He could stay with the, uh, the Pats. He's like, all right, no, this offense is good enough for me to win a Super Bowl with. Because that's what I didn't have on my last team was some more weapons. So that's why you go there. So you would think, all right, if that's going to happen, then you need, then you should be shooting for a conference championship Super Bowl, even though they, they just want to get back to the playoffs. But I'm saying you don't sign Tom Brady just to get you to the playoffs. That's not why you signed him. You signed him because you think you can win a Super Bowl. You think, And if you think you can win a Super Bowl, if you don't win a Super Bowl, to a degree, it's a failure. Like I said, with all these teams and all these um, throughout the, the conference and even throughout the league, you have to see how it plays out. Like, again, if you have catastrophic injuries or you got a bad luck or a bad bounce or something like that, like, is it a complete disaster? No, but if you're a team like the Saints or you're a team like the Niners or like the Cowboys, any of these top, presumably top teams in the conference, if you don't, if you're mainly healthy, and like, well, also you got to deal with the Rona now this year, so that's going to be a little, an extra added twist into the season. But if you are mainly healthy and you don't get there, then I think it's worth considering. At least, I mean, failure is probably a strong word, but like most, it's fair to consider it a disappointment at least. Because again, if you get through the season, you're mainly healthy, and you're one of these top teams, you should be in contention for a Super Bowl. And if you're not, I think a disappointment at the very least is is fair to point out. Like I said, failure may be a little strong depending on how it goes, but I think for those five teams, and like I mentioned, you could throw in the Eagles, throw in the Seahawks, throw in um, potentially even the Rams. Maybe Vikings, one of the Bears, Vikings, Bears, kind of. You could throw those guys in, too, because those are teams that are, should all be in the mix for the playoffs. And if they're not, then that's that's a disappointment in and of itself, especially with the extra playoff spot this year, I believe. But, I, like, those top five teams, Saints, um, Saints, Niners, Packers, Cowboys, Bucks, if those five teams aren't in contention, then then uh, something's gone wrong. And you should be able to point that out. But that's just my opinion, again. You don't have to agree. And speaking of not agreeing, if you listen to the last episode, you know I went through a list of the top five, of the top, I guess it was top 20, but I would just mainly focus on the top 10, um, top 10, the top five, number one picks in the last 20 years in the NBA. And I figured I would do it again, but for the NFL. So this will be my own list. This is not a list that someone else compiled. This will be my own list. So I'll look through the top uh, the number one picks in the last 20 years, rank them in terms of like their career and stuff. Again, obviously, not including uh, who's the most recent one. 
I should know this. Oh, not including Joe Burrow, because obviously he hasn't played in the NFL yet. And even like Kyler Murray is kind of like that's a tough one too, because he's only played one year. But but still, I guess they're gonna be a part of it in terms of just like the from the time period. But look through it, ranked mainly just top five. But if I have enough time, maybe get into the top ten. But we'll discuss that after break. Stay right there. Check out the show built around the women of MMA from the UFC, Invicta FC, Bellator, and one championship. We got the fights covered. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know we're to listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. So I was looking over this, like these number one picks. Is in, in my and when I was going through it, I was like, all right, there was a lot of good NBA players. Like this shouldn't be that hard, um, bros, and and ladies. Again, don't I don't just assume men listen to this podcast. I know there's ladies out there that love sports too. But if you look at from 2000 onward, I mean, this list is very shaky. Not gonna lie to you. There might. They like we'll get to it, but I think there's like one, like surefire Hall of Famer on this entire list. A couple guys that could make it, um, but I think there's only one surefire Hall of Famer, and he just retired this past off season. Jeez. All right, so we'll go through, we'll go through the the the, the 21st just to kind of refresh everybody's mind. So 2000, you got Courtney Brown, defensive end from Penn State, drafted by Cleveland. Um, accomplishments very limited. Um, you got Michael Vick, uh, Virginia Tech, Atlanta Falcons. His compliments are a little bit longer. David Carr, uh, obviously not exactly the the greatest first pick for the Texans. Um, though his offensive line was bad, so not all his fault, but still. Carson Palmer, USC, went to the Bengals. Not bad. Eli Manning, originally drafted by the Chargers, and then obviously was eventually traded. Um, Alex Smith. You from Utah went to the 49ers, had good years there, and with um, the, the uh, Chiefs. Now, Mari Williams, defensive end from North Carolina State, ended up in Houston, uh, had had not a bad career for number one pick. Um, you got Jamarcus Russell, LSU, went to Oakland, we all know how that ended. Jake Long, offensive tackle from Michigan, went to the Dolphins, again, not a bad career. You got Matt Stafford, went to Georgia, uh, went to the Lions. Still playing, but again, not the not a great career, but not a bad career. You went to Sam Bradford from Oklahoma, went to St. Louis Rams. Started out okay, but just he could never really stay healthy. Then you got Cam. Obviously went to Auburn with the Panthers. Uh, not with the Panthers anymore, still waiting on a team, but you got him. Then after him was Andrew Luck. Went to the Colts. Had a soccer before he decided to retire early. Um, Eric Fisher, the tackle, he was from Central Michigan, ended up in Kansas City. Just won a Super Bowl. Shout out to him. Um, Jadavion Clowney, obviously with the Texans, and then these are the ones the more recent ones you guys know. Jameis, then you got Jared Goff, then Miles Garrett, Baker, Kyler Murray, and Joe Burrow, obviously most recently. So when you look at this list, um, not great, not awful, not awful, but not like great. So there's only three guys that have won a Super Bowl, one being Eric Fisher, who just won one, um, the other one obviously being Eli. And then the last one being David Carr as Eli Manning's backup. So, not exactly the greatest list. Um, and when you go through these, I mean, I kind of came up, I don't want to say I came up with this on a whim, but like this wasn't like, um, I'm just like, this is like more or less like off 
just I kind of thought about it because I was going to do this on, I thought about it like over uh, Wednesday and Thursday. So again, you may disagree and you may not, but I feel like the best number one pick like has to be Eli, right? Like, again, is he the best player? No, not even close. Not by any stretch. But he's tied for the most, the Pro Bowls. I think the most anybody of these top picks has is four. Um, Yeah, the most anybody has is four. So he's got the four Pro Bowls. He never made an all-pro team, I don't believe, which, I mean, hey, not so bad. But he's won two Super Bowls and won two Super Bowl MVPs, including beating Tom Brady and Bill Belichick, the GOATs, the GOAT coach, GOAT quarterback, twice, and once when they were 18 and up. And he's probably the only one that, as of right now, is a Hall of Famer, honestly. So, I mean, like, that's got to put him at number one, right? Even though, again, is he the best player? Probably not, but just career-wise... I don't really know who else you could say has had a better career than Eli up to this point, which, again, is kind of an indictment on these number one picks because Eli, Eli's career is good, but, like, he shouldn't even be a lock for the Hall of Fame. He's, he is because he's going to get in, but, like, he shouldn't be, like, a certain lock. And, I mean, we discussed, we discussed his, like, um, legitimacy in the Hall of Fame and stuff like that on past episodes. I mean, I agree that he'll get in, but... Again, you could argue, like, when you think of a Hall of Fame, like, that's Eli Manning is not somebody you think of. Unless you're a Giants fan, obviously. If you're a Giants fan, then you'll disagree with this. But I guess maybe that's just my own personal opinion. So then he's probably the best. Then second, I would go with... Because this, I mean, it's 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 interesting. Because I don't know... Because you could argue Andrew Luck was a better quarterback than Cam, right? Like, you could legitimately make that argument. And no one would really blame you. But he didn't win an MVP, and I feel like that holds a little bit more weight to me. And also, his career is not done, so maybe he could add to it a little bit more. But he he won MVP and led the team to a Super Bowl. That just puts him ahead of Andrew Luck for me a little bit. Now, again, I do contend that Andrew Luck is probably a better quarterback than Cam Newton. But again, they do different things, so it is what it is. Um, but the MVP and Super Bowl appearance, even though they lost, even though they did lose. And Andrew, and Andrew Luck does have him on the uh, on the Pro Bowl. He's got one more Pro Bowl. He got a comeback player of the year and a passing, I think it was a passing yards or passing touchdown, passing touchdowns leader. But Cam, even though he only has three Pro, Bowl, three Pro Bowls, excuse me, talking has been tough this episode. Uh, he's got the first team All-Pro and got the MVP, Offensive Player of the Year, one Rookie of the Year too. So it's hard for me to say that, like, Andrew Luck is surefire better than him, but again, if he plays more and didn't retire, maybe he would have been, but, I mean, based solely on the NFL, uh, well, even if you go to college, I mean, Cam won an after championship, so that doesn't matter, um, but yeah, I, I guess I probably have to go with Cam, but I would put Andrew Luck third, so he's my number three um, in terms of best players, though, I mean, you can make the argument for Mario Williams being higher, because even though... He wasn't like the greatest number one overall pick. He still made four Pro Bowls, still had almost 100 sacks for his career, which isn't isn't nothing. One made a first team All Pro, two actually. Hold on, yeah, I'm actually put him third. Yeah, because he's made three All Pro teams, a first team, and two second teams. He in his career, he had what? What's his high sack total? He had a he had a 14 sack season, a 12 sack season, a 13 sack season, a 14 and a half sack season. I forgot he had that really good year randomly with Buffalo in like 2014. Um, so yeah, actually, I might put him third, only because uh, nah, screw it, it's my list. I'm keeping Andrew Luck third just because I think he's a better player. But Mario Williams, as like as crazy as it sounds, like he's not. He wasn't like. I mean, most people don't think about him too much when you think of like recent. Uh, recent number one, well, recent as in like the last like 10 to 20 years, number one picks. But he actually wasn't that bad, honestly. No one really talks about him, but like he, I mean, I maybe mean, outside of the Texas, but he actually wasn't that bad considering where he was picked. Um, again, there are, there are a lot, there are a lot of picks, there are a lot of top highly picked pass rushers that don't get anywhere near 100 sacks for their career, and he ended up with 97 and a half. So, I mean, it's not bad. 16 forced fumbles, 21 pass deflections. Again, like I said, three all-pro teams, one first, two second. Like, that's not 
not the worst, honestly. You could do a lot worse than that. But I just, again, I just think Andrew Luck was probably a better player. Overall, you can make an argument that Andrew Luck was, at minimum, a top five quarterback for at least three to four seasons of his career. I would make that argument. Again, I don't know if that bears out, but I think you can make the argument for at least... Like, even if you play this year, he would have been considered a top quarterback, in my opinion. Again, he had some injuries, but... I mean, he had multiple 4,000-yard seasons. I mean, every year he had 4,000 yards except for 2013, and obviously the one year he missed some games. Had a 40-touchdown season. Had a 39-touchdown season last year. Well, two years ago, I guess I should say. Um, had the big playoff comeback against the Chiefs. Um, had some playoff success again. Didn't didn't win any Super Bowls or anything, but had some success in the league. Um, outside of, like I said, that one year. Had won 11 games three times, won 10 games once. So, like I was saying, Mario Williams is definitely not a bad number one pick, but uh, I don't know. I just I personally believe Andrew Luck, which is like at at his best, was probably a little bit better of a player. Even though again, fourteen and a half sacks is nothing to scoff at. So I, I don't. I'm not trying to sit here and, and disparage Mario Williams too much, but again, this is just my own personal list. Um, but again, he had a great career, which I, I feel like not enough. Oh, not great. He had a solid career for number one pick, which I feel like not enough people talk about. And then five was interesting because like, I want to put Mike Vick on there because if he doesn't go to jail and maybe he gets and starts to care about the quarterback position a little bit more before he gets to Philly, um, he could have been one of the top guys. Apparently, I mean, he's not going to win two Super Bowls most likely, but he could have been at least higher up on Cam. But also when you look at like Jake Long, the tackle, I know obviously it's hard to judge offensive line play. But, I mean, the guy made four Pro Bowls and was an All-Pro. And was a starter for six years as a left tackle. Again, he was he's out the league early. So, done by 31. But, I mean... I mean, I'm going to say my Vic because I'm biased. That's what that was like him and AI are my two favorite players growing up. Um, but I mean, if someone wants to put Jake Long, I can't blame you, but I'm just going to, I'm just, I'm not leaving Michael Vick out of my top five again. You can agree. You can disagree. I honestly, it doesn't matter because everyone's in doubt of their opinions. You may think my opinion on this is wrong, but hey, I will admit that when it comes to Mike Vick and when it comes to Allen Iverson, mainly the long, those only two athletes I'm somewhat biased against. I'm not going to ever call them like the greatest of all times or anything, not that level of bias, but like if I can fit them in, I'll try to fit them in. Um, but yeah, like I'm again, Mike Vick is the, one of the main things that got me into football and got me into wanting to play quarterback, not the only quarterback, but he's, he's one of them. And, and even with his career, um, it's just like, it's just like a weird, cause he has like the gap where he was in jail. Um, but then, then also just like his numbers really passing wise aren't that great. He only had 3000 yards twice, um, 2010. In 2011 with with the Eagles. Only threw for over 20 touchdowns twice. Um, obviously had the the good rushing stats. Um, but still, that that the game against Washington on the Monday night game, one of the best performances I've ever seen from a quarterback, literally ever. Um, also ran for first quarterback to run for 1,000 yards in a season, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. And... Also, I mean the the run where you have where, you, where the, the against Minnesota to win the playoff game where he literally like splits between two defenders that run into each other as he runs into the end. well not it, it didn't run to the end zone immediately after but you, you you know the play I'm talking about you get the point. Um, See, so yeah, I just think like he has and he was just such an important player to not just Atlanta at the time but also just like football, especially for a lot of African Americans out there that wanted to be a quarterback but didn't really have a guy that you could look at to be like, oh, this is, I want to say role models, obviously, the, the dogfighting thing. No, people have done much worse. Um, I like to remind people of that. Like, he served his time, went to jail, reformed himself. Like, people still try to get on him. But, again, the man went to jail. Is dogfighting good? No, not at all. But people have done worse things, A. And B, the man served his time. It is what it is. Um, But, yeah, like I said, I'm biased. So I'm going to put him in there. So he's probably going to be at five. So, and like I said, if you look to the top ten, if you look to the top of the last thing, because the guys like Clowney and Garrett, like they may be higher, but they're not. They haven't had enough yet. Um, 
even like Kyle will probably be up there. Eventually, maybe even Joe Burrow, and Baker too. Like there are guys that could potentially rise up the ranks, but as of right now, they just haven't done enough, and it's not their fault. They're just they're new to the league. But like I said, you look through the top five number one picks, or well, my top five number one picks of the last twenty years. I mean, Eli, Cam, Luck, and, Mar- and Mario Williams could flip flop, and then Jake Long and Mike Vick five six they could easily flip flop. But I feel like. Eli and Cam, just because Eli with the Super Bowls and Cam with the MVP, it's you can't really put anybody above those two guys, which is crazy because I don't even think Eli is the best player. Like Eli is not the best player on this list at his peak. Like he's not better than probably the four guys below him in Cam, Andrew Luck, Mario Williams, and Mike Vick. But Super Bowls, you can't argue with that. And the same thing for Cam. Cam, you could argue maybe Andrew Luck was a better quarterback. I would argue that, but. Came out the MVP, came out the All-Pro, came with the Super Bowl. Number one pick-wise, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to transform your franchise, potentially get them, and win them a Super Bowl. And that's what those guys, well, that's what Cam almost did, and that's what Eli did. So it's hard for me to argue with anybody else. But all the other ones after two, I mean, you could interchange them all. Hey, like I said, debate your own. Look, look it up for yourself. Maybe, maybe you want to put Carson Palmer in there somewhere. You want to put... Alex Smith in there somewhere. Like again, be my guest. I'm not saying that this this this. Maybe you want to slide Matthew Stafford in there because he's the. I think it was like the fastest of forty thousand yards or whatever. He's probably he has a good chance to be the all time passing yards leader at least. Only been to one Pro Bowl, but I mean he's gonna have a lot of stats. So, again, make your own list. Send it to me. Let me know. Tell me why I'm wrong. Bring it on. I am more than willing to talk about that. I'm more than willing to talk about that. More than willing to talk about big storylines you're looking forward to from the MLB. More than happy to talk about Vince Carter. Maybe you are unlike me and think he's a, a surefire 100% lock for the Hall of Fame. And not like one of those guys that's going to get in just because it's easy to get in. Maybe maybe, maybe you can open my eyes to Vince Carter. Maybe it's something I'm missing out. Again, I think he's a good player. But um, a lock for the Hall of Fame. Outside of the dunking ability, like, eh. eh debatable. Um, but... Again, he's going to get in. I'm not really concerned about that. Tell me, maybe you don't you you think there's other teams like maybe you think I should have put the Eagles or the Seahawks in their teams under the most pressure, and if they don't get to Super Bowl or conference championship, it's a it's the massive failure or disappointment. And I said, I just want to have a debate. I just want to have a discussion with all of you guys. That's all I'm doing on these podcasts, just discussing sports topics. So, if you think I'm wrong, you you want to have a discussion about something I said, I'm more than happy to do that. But that'll do it for me here today on the GSMC Sports Podcast presented by GSMC Podcast Network. I want to thank you guys, as always, for listening. If you like what you've heard today, like you've heard in the past from other episodes, you want to make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, make sure you're always on top of when we drop our latest stuff. Also, if you like what you've heard, um, could you please give us a rating, five-star rating, write us a review. We very appreciated. It's very helpful. I'll see what you guys like. If you guys dislike the ways you can improve, different topics we can talk about, stuff like that. And also, if you're on social media, we're on social media. So find us there. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We can talk. We can chat. We can debate. We can discuss. You can give maybe, maybe there's certain topics that I haven't been touching on recently that you want me to touch on. That's that's a great way to do that, um, to, to let me know or let the other hosts know. And also, if you if you disagree with something I've said, it's another way to let me know. Again, it's all sports. Everyone has their own opinions. I like sports, you like sports. Let's just talk about sports. That's all I want to do. Um, but yeah, again, I'm going to do my... Not, not daily. I can't... I can't. My episodic... I don't even know if that's the right word, but... My regular shout-out to the essential workers out there. Like I said, EMTs, nurses, doctors, uh, firefighters, grocery store workers, retail workers, delivery drivers, mailmen, male women... All you guys out there that have been deemed essential and have been working through this pandemic to make sure people like me and my family and other people's families out there can remain safe. You are appreciated, even if, again, if you don't hear it enough, you will at least hear it from me. So hopefully that that can I, that can brighten your day for you. I try my best. Um, but yeah, and also, so like, again, treat those guys with respect if they're, you're out there. Just wear your mask. It's not that hard. It's not going to hurt you. It, it may save your life because it makes it harder to transmit the disease if you have a mask on. So just wear a mask. Um, also, 
if you're going to be out and you're out and about in the States now, especially in the Northeast where we kind of have it Corona under control, knock on wood, um, because the second wave is probably coming at some point, especially during once flu season picks back up and later in the year, uh, that'll be a mess. But for right now that we have things under control, more or less, I say we as if I'm in charge, but like the, the States have it under control. So if you're out and about, like I said, wear a mask, socially distance. And if you're going to a bar or a restaurant, or hopefully not a nightclub, because that's that's definitely a little dangerous. Close, if, don't go to any in, inside enclosed spaces. That's that's literally asking almost to get the disease. Um, but if you like I said, you're at a bar, you're at a restaurant, or whatever. Tip your waitresses, tip your bartenders. If you're gonna be out, I know everyone's struggling through this pandemic, but I know they've been hit, and they're already they're already a job that doesn't have high wages anywhere. They make their money off of tips. So if you're gonna be out there, at least if they again, I'm not just saying to. Just give them a hundred dollars just just because, but like if they if they do a good job, just be a little bit more appreciative, be a little bit more generous towards them. Because like I said, they've been through a lot, we've all been through a lot. But like I said, any little thing you can do to help brighten someone else's day, why not do it? But that'll do it for me here today. I've been Chris Blades. That has been my time. And until next time, peace out. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program